Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time tuning in, my name's Jeremy, and today I'm gonna be assembling the short block for our piggy bank horsepower challenge. It's a budget-friendly, 400-based, 426 stroker. It's easy on the wallet, it's gonna be a beast on the street. Let's get into it. Now, when I'm building an engine, I like to lay out all my parts in front of me so that I can see where I'm at in the process. Plus, it helps limit the amount of times I'm having to run to AutoZone for that random part, right? So, this is what I got so far. As you can see, I'm kind of limited on space here in the garage, but I've got my bearings, main and rods, the rods themselves, the beautiful pistons lined up there. I've got my main bolts, the wrist pins for the pistons, timing set, caps for the rods, the classic Mopar purple camshaft, and then of course, the block and the crankshaft. So let's get into some details now. Here's the 400 block that I'm using for this build. It's an early 230 casting. I won't go in too great a detail for the history of it as I already pushed out a video last year talking about the rarity of it, why everybody wants it for a stroker, and where to find them. What I do want to talk about is what has been done to it to lead us to today. So it's been hot tanked, magna fluxed, bored and honed to 4.375. That's the board, it's 33 over. I also had new cam bearings put in and freeze plugs put in. So right now, this is ready to assemble. Uh, it does have a nice paint job, which I just pushed all that out on a short. So if you're not subscribed and you don't want to miss anything, please hit that button. Uh, I went with a weird gold just because I like to be different. Decided to go against the Hemi Orange for once. All right, I like to start with the camshaft so that I've got all the room needed to guide it through there and not damage the bearings. So this cam is actually a Mopar Performance purple shaft. Uh, it's been sitting on the shelf since the early 90s. It's uh, advertised duration of 280. Let's snag some assembly lube. Uh, lift of 474, both intake and exhaust. And this is all in 110 lobe set, so it should sound pretty decent and give me enough power. Start by flipping the block over here. I can see everything. Now I did go and clean up the camshaft a little bit, but as you can see, it's not in too bad a shape. Just uh, some surface corrosion here from sitting for 30 years. But I'm going to be pretty uh, liberal with all the lube here. I make a few tools to do this, which is fantastic, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it by hand. Really careful. Before putting it in its final position, I'll put a dab of lube again on the bearing surfaces, as some of it kind of got wiped off when I was installing it. Should be able to rotate. Camshaft, yeah, see, just with my fingertips here. So, that is good. While I've got the block like this, I'm going to go ahead, bolt on my main caps with bearings, and verify my oil clearance. Alright, a little hard to read. Looks like I got a 2.62. Which makes sense, because I actually had this turned down to right about there. So 2.622-ish. So this has got some air in it, of course, it's not perfect. But I did have the crank turned down 20 over, so normally it's a 6 or 2.624, but I'm getting 6.622, which is about right. Uh, and that gives me a little bit between two and three thousandths of oil clearance. Now, essentially, I'm going to go through, confirm the other four, match them to their journal, uh, and if all is good, we bolt another crank next. All right, I love this tool. All right, all right I'm going to go ahead and lube this up. Now, there will be some people that are probably yelling at this video. Why don't you stop and go get a dial bore indicator? I was able to tell enough for my comfort level with the caliper. Plus, as soon as I get this crankshaft in here, I'll give her a spin and we'll also get the field test going on as well. So I'm not too worried about it. Alright, next I'm going to grab this big boy. And drop it in nice and slowly. I'm 
for some more lube. All right, now that I got my caps back on, make sure they're all seated. I'm gonna throw the main bolts back in, just get them snug, and then I gotta center the thrust bearing uh, with a few smacks of a hammer, and then we'll start tightening. I don't have the mechanism here for the rear main seal, so I've got one on order. My original one cracked down the middle, so I'm gonna have to hold off on the rear main seal, but I can still get everything else. All right, I got them snug, so now I'm gonna give it a few smacks. ARP is kind enough to provide us with the torp sequence. 35 foot pounds, 70, and then 110. Let's get to it. Now this crankshaft was originally from a 3 to 3. It's a forged unit. I had the rod journals offset ground to increase the stroke to 3.545. And the good folks at Crower did a balance job. And as you can see, they took a ton of material off. Bob weight was now 2260. Moment of truth. Oh yeah. That's money right there. Looking good. Now the orientation of the rods is extremely important. If you put them in backwards, it's not going to let you rotate it at all. Essentially, and this will come through that cylinder wall there, this is the taper side. You can see it's uh, a lot more pronounced than this side. This side faces the other rod. This side faces the crank. And there's a little contour there and it would fall just like that with the bearing. Okay, now that I've got the crankshaft and the camshaft installed, I've got to make sure that my pistons are actually correct in the lineup that I have. As you know, the intake valves are closer together, just like this, uh, for the intake. So now I'm going to go and verify that I didn't screw this up. Let's swap my hands here. That would be correct. Uh, and now we can go ahead and assemble these bad boys. Alright, I am probably going to make a mess, so I've got plenty of paper towels. But... It's time to assemble these bad boys. I've got all my wrist pins soaking in some oil. These are all floating, so this should be no issue. I don't have to heat these or anything like that. Move that. It should be as simple as slipping it in and installing the spiral locks. Easier said than done, right? Now the rods I'm using for this budget stroker are scat forged I-beams. I got them in a length of 6.7 inches long to maintain the high rod ratio in hopes of spinning this big block stroker to the moon. The pistons, they're forged icon units with a compression height of 1.48 inches. Together, combined with that small stroker, should bring the piston flush with the deck. This is going to make a lot of compression, and I'm hoping it makes at least 550 horsepower. Man, I forget how much of a pain those freaking spiral locks were. I bent one of the first ones and then tried it on like four other pistons. Finally, I was able to bend it back and get it in shape and finish off assembling the rods and pistons. So All right, now before I can actually install these bad boys into that block, I do have to verify a couple things. Uh, for one, I gotta put these on, but I gotta verify what the ring gap is. If it's too close, they can break the piston as soon as it heats up and expands. And as you can see, I've already got one in here. Typically, I'll use a piston and just kind of press it in so that it's all equal, but it's like there's no gap at all. So these have to be filed. Um, in fact, if I get the feeler gauge, you know, I can use the, the lowest one I've got, which is four thousandths, and I can barely, no, I can't even get it in. So this is way too tight. Not going to work. Time to pull these out and file them down. Now, I don't have a dedicated ring gap filer, and I don't really want to use an angle grinder, so I'm just using a good old-fashioned flat 10-inch file. Now, I'm just going for a street strip bill with this one, so according to the formula, I'm looking for a ring gap of two hundredths. And the last one, I always flip it over, take off any kind of bevel that I might be putting on the ring. Okay, we'll take this over and go see where we're at. For the top ring, uh, sometimes there'll be a dot. This one just has writing, no dot. So this is the top portion. It goes in like this. So I'll take one of the pistons I've got, and I'll kind of even out the ring, taking it down to where the oil ring goes, that kind of depth, just because there's a slight taper sometimes in the top of these. You want to get it nice and level. Now I'll get the feeler gauge out. All right, I think I'm a little bit shy on this one, but uh, I'll hit hit it with 19, see if we're in the clear. 
No, not 19. Let's try 14. Nope. 12. Yeah, 12 works. So it's going to be either 12 or 13, which means I'm a little more than halfway there, so do it a few more times. Alright, let's see, second time works out better for us. Let's try 20. Yes, 20, but it's a little bit tight. Okay, then we go over. Let's try 21. No. Okay, so right on. That reading is done. Just 16 more. All right, now that the pistons all have their rings, are ready to go. There's one last thing we've got to do before we can start bolting these in the engine. And just like with the main bearings, we've got to verify our oil clearance on the rod bearings. All right, we pick our bearings. Same deal as with the main. I'm gonna bolt them through the cap, measure the inside diameter, and see what we've got. Make sure to give it a good torque. Again, I don't have a dial bore indicator, but I do have my caliper. Okay, that just bounced a little bit, but that's right at 2.2. 2. All right, see what these rod journals measure. And we have got just a hair underneath 2.2, so it's 2.198. So about uh, two thousandths, uh, which is about right. These are 2.2, .2. we would expect uh, at least one thousandths per inch of diameter. And so that's actually plenty for what I'm looking for. Good to hear, now I just gotta check uh, the other seven. All right, so I just finished checking the oil clearance. Seven of them were right where I expected, around two thousandths of clearance, which is perfect for the diameter of the rod journal. One of them was about three thousandths. Uh, I'm using a caliper. It could be the air in the instrument, but it might be a little bit wider than the rest. Even so, three thousandths is not too bad. I know a lot of people will say that's more for like a race application, but uh, I'm gonna take it. I don't think it's gonna be an issue. All right, I used to fight this step a lot, which was always a pain. Uh, I never had a ring compressor when I would do this installation. Uh, I finally got one, so I'm gonna give it a shot today. First, I'm gonna set my ring gaps and get them 180 apart. Slide it on in here and get it started. And then I'll grab the compressor. Now this was only about 15 bucks on Amazon nowadays. So definitely affordable. Let's see how easy this is. Bam. Now, if you noticed on that last clip, I actually installed piston number one and two cylinder number two. It was my fault. I was doing it about one o'clock in the morning, figured it out of the sixth piston. So I took them all out and reinstalled them in the correct order. All right, so I've got the rotating assembly bolted in the block, all torqued down as it should. One of the biggest concerns that a lot of people have raised with uh, this type of stroker assembly using the 2.2 uh, big end rod journal size is that they're always concerned about uh, side clearance on the big end of the bearing not matching the Mopar spec having a little bit of extra room so this has been debated for a long time um, having the extra room the side clearance on the rods really just uh, allows it to have a little bit more splashing effect on oil if I can get the right side of the feeler gauge here 
So I want to see what we actually have. Uh, I suspect it's not going to be too far out of whack. This is uh, the quarter right here, 0 0.025. Definitely bigger than that. Some folks like to run that or less. Let's see what we got. Let's do 20 and 21, so essentially 0 0.041. So about uh, four hundredths or forty thousandths, which is not bad at all. Some people have actually run like seventy thousandths of clearance on the rods. I'm not concerned about that. Worst case scenario, if there were low oil pressure issues, all I would do is swap to a high volume pump. Uh, but it's just going to be extra oiling here for the rod journals uh, and, and bearings. So I'm not concerned about it. I'm gonna run it. If anything, it's gonna help me with the higher RPMs I'm trying to push on this engine. All right, it's been a couple days since I've been able to work on the stroker. So my rear main seal has arrived. This is one of those uh, billet pieces you can get uh, from a variety of vendors. I picked this one up from Mancini Racing. It was around 37 bucks. And while I was placing an order, I also ordered just uh, an engine dress-up kit so I can have all the hardware I need. When I tore this engine apart, it was three years ago. Half the hardware's gone. I can piece together some stuff, but I'd rather just have it all nice and clean. Plus those have those little Mopar emblems on the top. At the stroker, all I've got to do now to complete this short block is install that rear main seal, install the timing gear set, which I will do here in just a moment. And then I'll probably actually put the oil pickup tube and the oil pan on, just kind of seal it away from the elements. And then this short block will be done. So let's get to it. All right, so I've got the seal prepped and ready. It's located inside the new housing with the thicker part headed towards the engine. I always add some silicone, oops, I just lost a bolt there, to the corners. I don't want to get them on the threads, but I do need to have some sort of sealant because those little stick seals just never seal the way they're supposed to. They always leak. So I'm going to go ahead and place this in. So you've got some good silicone at the bottom. That's all I really need. And now I will insert these with the smaller side facing towards the seal, thicker side towards the block. Wiggle them both in at the same time. Which is gonna take two hands for me, so. By the power of YouTube, bam. Definitely a two-hand job. You know, these two don't want to go in together. But once you get them both started, you can evenly guide them down with the cap, and you're good to go. So this is torqued to 30 foot-pounds. Already been torqued. Moving on to the tiny chain. All right, now that I've got the timing set on, you know, the dots, they're kind of aligned. Uh, I'm not too confident in it, so I am going to confirm it. I'm not gonna degree it per se, I'm just gonna use the, uh, the lifter method. But it's time for me to put the bolt in and torque it down. This is the only bolt on the assembly that I will use Loctite with. Just the blue stuff, not the red. Um, especially on a single bolt setup, if it was a three bolt, a little bit different, but single bolt cam, definitely. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now and torque it to 35 foot-pounds. All right, now that my camshaft is installed, bolt torqued, dots lined to line, it's time for me to confirm that it's actually true. So I've got my lifters installed, intake and exhaust uh, with these Mopars, right? They sit inside um, the lip there, so you can't actually take a straight edge across the lifter. So I've got additional lifters here just to kind of sit on top. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to confirm that they are indeed level. So I've got the straight edge on all four corners. And I don't have any wiggle. Mm -hmm. Looks like it is in fact touching on all four corners, which would tell me that it's not advanced or retarded, it's set it true, which is fantastic. So at least I know that the camshaft is true. Now this is a used cam and it's 
30 years old. So I'm also gonna do the same thing for cylinder number six to make sure that it wasn't twisted and just sitting on the shelf for some reason instead of being thrown in the trash. So the same thing here, take my straight edge. Um, I don't feel any wiggle. It's like touching all four corners. It's good to go. After a few weeks, she's done. This is the 426 budget stroker based on the 400 block, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video. Um, you know, I talk about this being a budget build, but how much did this actually cost? Let me break it down for you. Now, I actually had all the machine work done about three years ago. So I called the shop, got today's prices to make sure I could use it for this challenge. So you see those pistons hit me at almost $1,000, but the total came out to $2,922.42. Now, I know I'm spending more money than some of the other guys in this piggy bank horsepower challenge, but I really feel that if you're going to spend money on an engine at all and you want it to last, you're going to put that money in the short block. So I've got a fully forged 426 stroker right now with a really weird combination, that long rod ratio. I'm excited to see how it's gonna run, but for now, this is where we hold off. We've gotta let the rest of the team finish their short blocks so we can have the vote when it comes time for that. I really hope you remember this video. You think sort of stock Mopars, and we'll see where this thing leads when it comes to stage two when we get that long block together. So thanks for watching, until next time.